Virginia Hall, and I'm here to introduce to you Roger Rule, author of The Rifleman's Rifle and host of this series of episodes, Special Guns with Roger Rule. Thank you, Virginia. Welcome and welcome viewers to my fifth episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. <coughs> Roger, uh, let me ask you first, what is your definition of special guns? For this series, special guns are simply guns that uh, a gun enthusiast may have heard of but never encountered. And for my selection, I narrow down the focus to arms that hold an evolutionary or revolutionary place in the world of modern sporting arms over the last two centuries and have since uh, become classic guns because of it. <clears throat> and what do you have for us today? The gun I want to show today is a very unusual gun, and I have had several of these uh, spanning some 30 years. I still encounter the average gun lover that's never even heard of them. I'm talking about a drilling. What's a drilling? <laughs> a drilling is, it's not a brand, it's a type of gun with three barrels. Any gun with three barrels can be called a drilling. Drilling comes from the German word dry, or I'm not sure how you pronounce it, D-R-E-I, for three, which has been anglicized. And any gun with uh, four barrels are called veerlings. Uh, derivation from the German word for four, which is veer. The four-barrel versions, veerlings, are uh, quite rare. <clears throat> are these rifle barrels or shotgun barrels? Drillings can be a gun with uh, three shotgun barrels or three rifle barrels or any combination. The most common drilling, uh, like this one here today, has two shotgun barrels and one rifle barrel. Uh, and because uh, that's the most common configuration. When some collectors run across um, a, the rarer combination with two rifle barrels and one shotgun barrel, they often call it a double rifle drilling. Are they just made in Germany? Drillings are commonly made in Austria as well as Germany, but they have been made in England and Sweden, France, Italy, and many other countries. Most of them that we encounter have been uh, just made in Germany and Austria, though. What are they used for? Hunting. They date back to the early days of cartridge, uh, cartridge firearms <clears throat> and are guns used almost exclusively for hunting. The, uh, the advantage of having a single firearm that can fire both a rifle and shotgun cartridges is that a single gun can be used to hunt a variety uh, of uh, game from deer size game to uh, game birds. The hunter can select the barrel appropriate for the target just in seconds. <clears throat> Drillings are also popular with gamekeepers who often need the flexibility <clears throat> of the combination gun during their uh, normal duties. If you can get by with just one gun for all those purposes, wouldn't it be cheaper than buying two guns? Taking the place of two guns, you might think so. Um, you might think there's a cost savings advantage for having a drilling, but most drillings cost as much or more than the two guns they would replace. Drillings, veerlings, and there's a two-barreled <coughs> two version called a combination gun in America. They've been made since uh, uh, by some of the best makers in uh, both Germany and, and Austria. From, and, the, and they're expensive. From, from Germany, the pantheon of the best gun makers were in the city of Sewell uh, before World War II, and then it became a part of East Germany. And they're in the city of, uh, from the city of uh, Furlock in Austria before the war and still today. Don't they have particular hunting seasons in Germany and Austria? Yes, uh, in both Germany and Austria, they, are, they have specific seasons, but they overlap. The, uh, there's roe deer, wild boar, fallow deer, chamois, which is a little goat, uh, red deer, geese, pigeons, mallards, pheasants, partridges. There's a special uh, game bird called a capercaillie and a, and a and black cock. <coughs> black cock. A drilling is the uh, perfect choice of arm for anyone that might uh, be hunting a variety of, of this game with these overlapping seasons especially when that variety includes the winged, both winged and uh, four-legged animals. Uh, my guess is, uh, Virginia, you've never been to Austria? 
No, I have not. It's a beautiful country. <clears throat> uh, I've only been there once, but we didn't, and I didn't go there for guns. My wife and I went there uh, to Innsbruck for a ski trip. Um, you know, of course, while we were there, we looked around and saw all the uh, sites. Uh, New Schwanstein Castle, which I understand was uh, the model that Walt Disney used for Fantasyland. Uh, Tyrolia, Bavaria, the Black Forest. Black Forest is where the cuckoo clocks come from. And it's, it's uh, just stunning country. In fact, as a builder, I was looking at all the homes, and uh, I'd never seen anything like that. They... They're sort of a plaster. Well, they're, they're, I noticed two kinds of homes. The ones that were more in town had sort of a plaster finish, and then they had murals painted on the outside of their walls, like a forest scene, or some of them almost look cartoonish, like the animals look like Bambi. <clears throat> and um, the ones up in the hills, up in the mountains, uh, had their barn included in their house. They would put their, their animals in their house with them to keep warm, for the warm, not only keep the animals warm, but the animals' uh, warmth itself added to the their warmth uh, for the winter because it gets so cold there. Anyway, um, and then the commercial property, I was just amazed because uh, they had what they called Old Town and New Town. Innsbruck was divided like that. And we had dinner every night in Old Town. Um, and I, I had this habit of asking the manager when the the restaurant was built, and I was always shocked at the age that it gave me. <clears throat> and uh, so it, uh, it became my M.O. every time we went out to eat. That's the number one thing I did. Uh, and this was also during festival time, and so there were everybody were running around town in costumes, and it looked like the court jester, um, and uh, parade going through town. <clears throat> and I think that was a coincidence we didn't go there for the festival. Um, the last night we had dinner in Newtown, and I didn't expect to see or know that there would be any age on this restaurant. And at the end of dinner, I still asked the manager when was, <clears throat> if he knew when this building was built. And he said, oh, this is one of the newest ones in town. This was built two years before Columbus discovered America. You're kidding. No, dead serious. <laughs> uh, but let's get back to the gun of the day. Um, the drilling I want to show you is it's from a famous gun maker, Fransodia, located in uh, Furlock, Austria. And for just a little about the gun maker, Fransodia was the grandson of Anton Sodia, a great gunsmith himself, known for his skilled metalwork. He started his business in 1870 in uh, Unterfurlock. His son, Franz, or Franz, after completing his uh, apprenticeship with his father, moved to Furlock in 1910 and set up a business with uh, workshops and uh, eventually a company headquarters at Schulhausgasse 14 Furlock, where he produced hunting rifles using uh, semi-finished products from several outsources. By 1929, um, he was making guns totally in-house from start to finish. And then in 1935, Franz died, and his son, Franz II, or Franz II, took over the company. During World War II, Franz II lost the company, taken over by Slovenian partisans, but resumed ownership when Furlock was liberated by the British. Because the local British commander was an enthusiastic hunter, he allowed the company to continue making shotguns when the other arms and manufacturers were still closed down. By 1951, production, approved, production approval was again granted for all guns, and two large machine plants were set up equipped with a large number of specialized uh, equipment. In January 1974, France Sodia III took over the Furlock operation. In 1981, the company hosted a great celebration for its 110-year anniversary with national celebrities and famous economic and political personalities taking part. Then in August that same year, the Austrian Minister of Trade personally awarded the company the national honor, allowing the company to use the Austrian coat of arms in advertising and business, 
recognizing their products as being produced with national best quality craftsmanship. <clears throat> this is similar to the British royalty awarding the royal warrant for best quality and allowing those enterprises so awarded uh, to use it in advertising. So after that much introduction about this uh, grand sporting arm, uh, Virginia, are you ready to look at the gun? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, it is described as a Fransodia drilling, best quality, 12x12x308 12 by 12 by Win, which means Winchester, with a leather-fitted case, uh, which we will see in a moment. It's configured with uh, its two shotgun barrels side by side and one rifle barrel underneath, <clears throat> centered between uh, the two shotgun barrels. The 12x12 12 12 designation in this case means that both the side by side barrels are 12 gauge smooth bores or shotgun barrels, and the rifle barrel underneath is chambered uh, in 308 Winchester. When, uh, when was this gun made? It was built in 1971 and is uh, factory original, which makes it unusual as most drillings encountered uh, have their rifle barrels chambered in popular European cartridges, not American cartridges. Uh, yet most of those are much earlier, made much earlier than this one. The 1971 date of manufacture uh, places it in with other drillings that have been chambered in popular American cartridges. Uh, besides our 308 Winchester here today, other American cartridges that I've seen uh, in, in, include the 30-06, 270 Winchester, 257 Roberts, 243 Winchester, 22 Hornet, 222 Remington, and the near uh, worldwide popular 7mm Mauser. And that's just to name a few. Because uh, these guns have break open actions, it's much easier to make them with uh, rimmed cartridges, although the best makers now have no trouble with rimless cartridges <clears throat> like this 308 Winchester being reviewed today. Before we get into the features of this drilling, let me demonstrate the intricate mechanics of this complicated action. First, we check to see the safeties on. The safeties on this side of the wrist. Um, it's uh, English. It's uh, designed by W. W. Greener. It's an English type safety. It's not on the top tank. In the rear position, safety is on. Slide it forward. Is ready to fire. And now seeing it on safe, I'll now open the action and check uh, for live rounds. And we see what's in here are snap caps. There are three snap caps. Two for the shotgun shells and one for the rifle. Um, but I always pull them out to make sure they're snap caps and not live ammo. Now when I close it, we know with the snap caps in it, no harm will come to the uh, firing firing strikers or firing pins. Uh, I can dry fire it, which means pulling the triggers without live ammo in it. Also, when I close the action, the position of safety did not change. Uh, and I cannot dry fire it without sliding the safety off, moving it forward. <clears throat> so with three barrels and two triggers, how does all that work together? To answer that, there's a sliding switch where a safety normally is on the top tang. This is a barrel selector, and uh, you move it. <clears throat> uh, if you move it forward, it's in, it uh, puts it in rifle mode. Pulling it back puts it in shotgun mode, and you can't move it by accident. There's a little lock, small button on top that locks it. Have to press that down to make it work. The two shotgun barrels are now ready since it's in the rear position. And uh, there's an inscription above the uh, barrel selector, SCH, which is a German abbreviation for shotgun. In the forward position, the rifle barrel is now ready, and uh, the SCH is covered up, and there's a K visible, which is German for rifle. <laughs> so the shooter has to remember all of this? Uh, it's too complicated to remember, <laughs> unless you speak German. Now the function of this system takes care of it. Uh, look when I look what happens when I slide the barrel selector forward. 
and pointing at the rear sight. Slide it forward, the rear sight jumps up. This means not only that the sight is ready to use for the rifle, but it also it tells us that it's in the rifle uh, mode. And notice for the reverse, if I press the button and slide it backwards, uh, sight lies down, and now it's the gun is in the, the ready for the two shotgun barrels to fire. So just looking at the position of the rear sight tells us which mode it's in. Uh, now I'm ready to demonstrate the uh, dry fire process. I need to move the safety forward um, so that I can pull the triggers. And when the rifle sight is down, like it is now, I know that it's in the shotgun mold, mode. If I pull the triggers, uh, I just have to do this. Oops, you know what? It didn't get cocked. Okay. The left, this was in the, uh, the left, the rear trigger pulled the left, fired the left barrel, and the front trigger fires the right barrel. And when I open it, it just sets up the shells. They're not kicked out over my head because these are uh, extractors. They're not uh, automatic ejectors which uh, for guns not intended for dangerous game, these work fine. The extractors are in fact preferred by those who wish to reload their ammo or for those who don't want to leave empty cases scattered around the environment. Now when I <clears throat> close the action again and slide the barrel forward, um, the rear sight comes up and I know it's ready to dry fire the rifle barrel. So I'll pull that trigger there we go. And um, now the rifle cartridge sets up, but N is not extracted. Now I'll close the action and put the safety back on. It's amazing they can make it all like that. Work that yep, way. that's exactly the way I felt when I first saw my my first drilling. And in that dem in this demonstration, you'll notice uh, I haven't said anything about the scope. That's because I needed to explain the uh, mechanics without it first. The scope is an Austrian-made Carl Kalis model Helios Super uh, with a variable magnification of 2.3 to 7 power. It has a German number 5 reticle, which is a uh, typical crosshair uh, with lines, uh, bowl lines at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. Kind of like a duplex reticle with only three bowl posts. But the most important feature about the scope is that it's superbly mounted in the German claw mounts that I explained in episode 4. These are pricey mounts and more pricey to get a master <clears throat> gunsmith to install them. They are uh, well worth it for the, this type of gun especially when you find you have to uh, be in the field um, and uh, you might have the uh, need the scope off and on easily. Let me show you how it works. There are two buttons on each side of the rear base, and when I pull it up, I can just lift it right out. See how easy that was? If you are out in the field to shoot this gun at, as a shotgun, you would most likely have the scope stashed in your pocket, backpack, or a scope case like this one. Uh, and notice the rifle sight is down, so we know it's shotgun ready. If a roe deer comes along that you want to take instead of a partridge that you're after, you switch the barrel selector to rifle, and you can either use the leaf sight or reattach the scope, which is very quick. Uh, more importantly than being quick, it holds at zero, as we discussed in episode four. That looks really easy. It is, and as a personal note, I can vouch for this system working as designed because I've had this drilling at the range, and after sighting it in at a bench, I then put up a new target at uh, 50 yards um, with the scope on. I then <clears throat> I shot it, then stood up, removed the scope, put the scope back on, set back down, shot a second round, and uh, I can use this target right here shows the two rounds. This is basically was 50 yards, not 100, as the target said. But I was <clears throat> so impressed with this gun and myself with my eyes today. And of course, as usual, there were no witnesses around. Of course not. But after those results, uh, my thinking was at the time, 
you know, I would never sell this gun. Mm -hmm. Needless uh, to say, I was very happy with its performance and the way the claw mount system works. It really works. So back to the gun and its features. <clears throat> I've demonstrated the mechanics, so let's look at the rest of the metal work first. The action is a side-plated blitz action. It is not a side-lock action. That's something we'll cover in another ep episode. I'm going to open the action again. It has what is referred to in the industry as pretty double under lugs, which you'll see when we uh, examine this at the cross <clears throat> over at the sideboard. Uh, it also has a greener cross bolt, top lock, and then the action balls have pretty side clips. The receiver is case hardened coin finish, which contrasts uh, nicely with the rust blued parts. The blued components consist of the barrels, the trigger guard, the upper chain, and the top lever. The uh, action is elaborately engraved in the best Austrian style on the top, underside, and both side plates. It would rival anything coming out of Europe. It's, it is described as a uh, full deep relief Teutonic leaves and uh, scroll game, scroll and game uh, animals type of engraving. Virginia, just look at this engraving since you can see it up in close. Wow, the animals look so real. On the left, there are two row, that's this side here, there are two row deer and a red stag. On the right, there's a stalking fox after a partridge and three game birds. On the underside of the action where one of the underlugs protrudes, it is inscribed at the maker's address. The scroll engraving also uh, continues over the top of the receiver and on the all the attached parts. The barrels are 24 and 3 quarter inch long. They're the Bowler Blitz Stahl, which is German for special steel barrels uh, for lighter weight. The non-ejector barrels are choked, modifi modified in full, and chambered for 2 and 3 quarter inch shells. In addition to the flip-up rear sight, there's a bead front sight. On the top rib between the claw mounts, claw bases, the gun has gold-filled inscription, Fransodia, Furlock, Austria. We'll see that up close. Also, the triggers are gold. The intricately engraved blue steel trigger guard carries the serial number, 17816, and it's part of the lower tang. And the lower tang extends to a point very meticulously inlaid in the pistol grip, which brings us to the wood. Stock has unusually figure, uh, especially for drilling, and even as far as that goes for any German Austrian made gun. The French walnut color is rich and lively and warm brown with dark stump figure. Its uh, comb has a slight convex curve and it's described as a Roman comb, sometimes a Bavarian comb, and it has a small European cheek piece with a narrow but tastefully done uh, shadow line. Stock furniture includes an engraved bullet trap, which has a latch or a catch. Open it up uh, with a mechanical latch. It's uh, got cartridges in there. I've never seen anything like that before. Uh, the intended purpose was for those hunters who use this gun primarily for bird hunting might be out in the field when uh, suddenly uh, a deer pops up in their sights and having only brought shotgun shells uh, the in the stock bullet trap provides an emergency supply of cartridges. Back to uh, the other adornments. They, this includes a horn pistol grip cap with an engraved screw. <clears throat> uh, the rear sling eye between the bullet trap and the pistol grip and the front sling I mounted on the underside of the barrel. The elegant uh, forearm matches the stock color well and is executed with a wrap-around check ring, finely hand cut. The diamonds are still sharp to the touch with perfectly executed double borders. It's inlaid with uh, an Anson and a Dealey 
engraved form release finished to match the case uh, hardened action finish. The release is uh, inlaid into the wood with tight points at both ends. This entire gun is a true work of the gunmaker's art and easily rivals what the English call a best gun. Now let's disassemble the gun. Uh, first I'll remove the snap caps. And then taking the uh, opening the Anson Dealey release on the forearm. Move the top lever to the right and let the barrels down 45 degrees and we disassemble it into its three main major components. We'll take a look at these in a close-up at the sideboard. Here we are with the Fransodia drilling disassembled into its main components. Its leather case is custom fit with the accessories and it presents the disassembled gun very well with all the parts, including the scope, nicely uh, displayed in custom fit, fitted compartments with the maker's label. I'm gonna pick up the stock in action. Let's look at the uh, this half first. On the breech face, we can see that not only are the strikers bushed, uh, but the bushings have screws, set screws. We only see this on best guns. Notice the side clips on the receiver. These fit around matching bevels on the barrels. As I move the top lever to the right, looking down inside the action, we can see the locking bolt moving back and forth through the two bottom cutouts where the barrel's locking lugs fit into. At the front of the action is the hinge pin. There are some markings on the top of the left receiver wall, we see the serial number 17816. On the top of the right receiver wall, we see two proof marks and the numbers 963-71, which is a code <clears throat> that this gun was the 963rd gun proofed in 1971. The proof marks are NPF for nitro proofed in furlock. Incidentally, there is a fairly comprehensive list of proof marks by country in the Blue Book of Gun Values. Now picking up the barrels, we see the metal extension sticking out from the chambers that has a hole through it for the locking top bolt. This was originally designed by W.W. W. Greener and it's so usually uh, called a Greener cross bolt. <clears throat> Under that are the extractors as I've said, these are uh, not automatic ejectors. Uh, spent cases must be removed by hand. And on, on the bottom of this assembly, uh, actually on the bottom of the rifle barrels, the rifle barrel are the two uh, underlugs, usually called chopper lumps or underbites. The back sides of both of these uh, have square cutouts for the locking bolt. The front on the first one has the familiar semicircle cut out to go around the hinge pin of the action. Notice the front one is blued and engraved as it protrudes through the bottom of the receiver and it's visible when the gun is closed. This is sometimes called a platform lump. Forward of the two under lugs, about three inches, is the forearm locking lug. Looking at the markings, on the bottom of the three barrels, it reads Boiler Super Blitz for the type of steel. The two shotgun barrels are marked 1270 for their gauges. The rifle barrel is marked 308 WINCH for Winchester. On the left side of the chamber, um, for the caliber, and it carries a furlock proof mark. The barrel flats behind the shotgun barrels are stamped with furlock proof marks. Looking at the forearm, you can see the serial number on the inside on the uh, forearm iron. 
This part's for the forearm iron. And here's the Anson and Dealey release. That's inlaid so nicely in, in the... Uh, Finally, this type of sporting arm is very difficult to make, and it's made only by hand, by a handful of masterful gun, uh, gunsmiths, usually small makers that put in an extraordinary amount of time in building them, uh, resulting in a complete work of art. For new guns, these makers have to charge very high prices because they're made to order for customer, and they require so much time, ingenuity, skill, and artistry. So drillings like this must be really expensive. Compared to uh, most guns, yes. But I've always been amazed at how low their resale prices are in America, especially with respect to the resale value of fine double-barreled shotguns. Since these guns are more complicated and harder to make, there is real intrinsic value. It seems to me that when the public catches on, the demand will increase and these guns should move up the ladder in value with those in the category of best guns. They certainly seem worth it to me. That's it for today. Thank you, Virginia. And thank you, viewers, for watching. And if you enjoyed this episode, I invite you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and share with others. I hope you join us next week for another episode of Special Guns with Roger Rule. We'll be looking at a great double barrel shotgun. If you want to get involved with these types of guns, I recommend GunsInternational.com. The owners are great people. I know them and have been using their website since they started. I find it the best source for both buying and selling any great collectible gun.